thank you all for coming back on time. We've got our last presenter of the day, and then all of our presenters are going to join us for a panel discussion. Final reminder that if you have questions for any of our presenters today, please jot them on a white index card. Please write legibly and then drop them off at the frontier. We'll do our best to get it through as many of those as we can. So today we've talked about emotion regulation. We've talked extensively about trauma and borderline personality disorder. We've talked about treatment options. We've talked about cultural considerations. Our last topic for today is suicide, and in particular, an innovation that's been developed by Dr. Klonsky. The suicide research field is one that's troubled by a lot of methodological difficulties. One of the real advances that has happened in this field is the development of theories that help us understand the progression from ideation to action. I'm really delighted to welcome Dr. David Klonsky here to speak with us about his theory. Please join me in welcoming him. Hi, everyone. This is a very intimidating conference to speak at because of the combination of both the high stakes topic but the high level of expertise. Um, but I also feel very privileged to be here. I also feel, for better or worse, compelled to note that Dr. Williams, Monica, and I shared an office in graduate school. And I think I was best known to her as the person whose desk was so messy she had to formally request that I clean it. So she, and I think she was best known to me as the person who turned me in for having a messy desk. Um, but now I actually get to see her work and how incredibly important and compelling it is. And uh, oh well, next, next graduate school life, we'll have to get to know each other better. Um, I'll be talking about what I call the ideation action framework and the three-step theory of suicide with, with some special attention about how these perspectives apply to borderline personality disorder and PTSD. Um, I'm going to first start off by briefly addressing this question, why scientific research is uh, necessary in a, in a couple different ways, actually. Talk about the ideation action framework, including what it is and, and why it's, uh, it's necessary. And then talk about uh, a new theory of suicide uh, that we published just a few years ago and how it helps us understand suicide generally, but also in the context of BPD and trauma. So first things first, why scientific research is necessary. Now there are a few different ways to address this question. The first is simply that we have to understand suicide better. Uh, suicide is the top 10 leading cause of death, give or take, almost no matter where you look. There's of course some variation in this. Uh, in North America, it's number nine. And as I believe mentioned uh, at least this morning and possibly other times, it's also the number two cause of death in, in adolescents and young adults taking more lives than heart attacks, than cancer, than car accidents, than homicide, even though you don't seem to quite hear about it as, as much in this regard, and perhaps it doesn't receive the amount of funding and, and policy concern. Um, it's also important to note, and this is something that I often make a point to start with in the presentations, but I, I recognize for this group it's probably less necessary. Um, there is considerable stigma, not just around uh, BPD and mental illness, but also around suicide. Uh, there is some resistance among funders to fund research on suicide prevention, and I think there's some implicit or maybe even sometimes explicit beliefs that, well, even if we keep people alive, they're just sort of, they're not our best and brightest, um, which is a terrible perspective, but one I've run into. And so it's important to keep in mind that when we think about people who have survived early life suicide attempts, they include people like Martin Luther King Jr., like you know, Billy Joel, like Dr. Santa Ono, who's the president of my university at the University of British Columbia. In other words, uh, we're talking about, well, all people, including Nobel Prize winners, including top scholars, including renowned artists and musicians, including Olympic gold medalists, celebrities, philanthropists, um, people like us, our family members, our loved ones. Um, you know, when we see people who are struggling with suicidality, we're often seeing them at their worst but uh, we, we help them so that they can reach their best. Now, beyond keeping people alive, uh, it's important to recognize for every suicide uh, death, there's about 20 suicide attempts. And for every person who's attempted suicide, there's two to three people who have seriously considered suicide without attempting. And so I, I think it's fair to say that a large minority of people have experienced uh, suicidal ideation. And this isn't just a phenomenon that touches a few. Now, another way to address this question, uh, why scientific research is necessary, is to simply make the point that we're not doing well. 
Suicide rates are not decreasing in the U.S. If you look at the last 15 years, they've increased each and every year. If you actually pan out further, uh, take a 30-year perspective, they're holding about steady. Um, all prediction methods perform poorly, although I actually think this is not as, as terrible as we think, because if you look at other public health fields, whether it's um, drunk driving, heart attack, stroke, uh, fields where we've made a lot of progress, we actually are not very good at predicting. We've just gotten better at prevention. But it is useful to note that researchers seem to predict uh, suicide outcomes very poorly. In a meta-analysis that came out two years ago, they looked at all studies that predict something in the future about suicidality, deaths, attempts, ideation, and they compared the 1960s literature to today's literature and found that the, the effect size in these longitudinal studies today are about the same as they were 50 years ago. So we're at a, essentially at a 1960s uh, level of prediction in the research literature. There's also research that practitioners, when they try to classify people as you know, high risk or, or low risk, um, are predicting barely above chance. And there's evidence that our clinical risk tools, uh, even things that we come to rely on, uh, also predict very poorly. So by almost any metric, especially in the US, we're not doing well when it comes to suicide prevention. We need better research. Finally, it's important to note that when we have proceeded without scientific research, even with the best of intentions, even with the highest credentialed people, we have made mistakes. If you look at our track record over the last several decades, so especially some folks in this room familiar with DBT might know that early efforts to uh, have group treatments for suicide and self-harm among adolescents did not go well. And when they were finally studied in rigorous ways, it turned out that we were increasing the self-harm among people who received these groups, perhaps because they were normalizing self-harm for each other, perhaps because they were sharing ideas. So that's why in DBT, uh, we, we now have clear guidelines, what discuss gets discussed in group, what gets discussed in individual, uh, the, what we talk about uh, self-injury and, and suicide in the, in the groups themselves have certain limits, but we didn't know that at first and we only figured it out not through sort of our own professional judgment, but when we uh, did the studies. There's also a lot of times we, pr we proceed with the best of intentions in uh, the more public domain, outside the clinical domain. So there's many examples like this, but there was one example in Texas when a high school student died by suicide and they wanted to have a, uh, a, a you know, full page sp photo spread sort of co commemorating this person uh, in the yearbook, which sounds like a wonderful idea and even a wonderful anti-stigma idea. And at the same time, it has to be balanced by what we're learning from research on what might be called contagion. Uh, so we'll talk more about this uh, with some context later. but. In this particular case, if you imagine that at any given point in time, especially among adolescents, there's people struggling who feel lonely, and maybe they feel that they're not being taken seriously, if someone just like them in their community dies by suicide and suddenly the community rallies around them, suddenly all their peers uh, r rally around them, take them seriously, you're accidentally giving the message to these struggling and in some cases suicidal adolescents that what you can't achieve in your life you can achieve through your death. And it can be very dangerous when we proceed with these kinds of things without the benefit of good research. There's also a lot of myths that have gotten in, in our way when it comes to suicide prevention. One of them is that uh, suicide attempts are, uh, are cowardly. Uh, this is not only stigmatizing, but in some ways it's, it goes against an important truth that we're learning. And that is that a key reason why most people with suicidal thoughts don't attempt, even if perhaps that's the choice they would prefer to make, is that attempting suicide is scary. We're deeply wired to avoid pain, injury, and death. And so there's actually some amount of capability or even, um, it's not the best term, bravery that's required to transition from suicidal thoughts to death. So this myth is both stigmatizing but also distracting from the processes that can help us understand uh, the, uh, how suicide attempts occur. There's, of course, myths that suicide and related behaviors are for attention. This can happen, but is not even close to what's typical and the, the most accurate way to understand suicide. We'll talk about that, too. There's myths that suicide is somehow primarily about impulsivity. We'll talk about this as well. But in brief, it is simply not true that people who attempt suicide are more impulsive than people who seriously consider suicide, who, you know, who have suicidal thoughts, but don't attempt. This has been looked at by numerous labs, numerous measures, in numerous ways. It just simply does not pan out. And that is a, a belief and maybe a, a myth that has misled us in the field for quite a while. So we need to, to pay close attention to doing good scientific research for all these reasons.
Now, with that as a backdrop, I'll turn to the substance of the talk and first talk about the ideation action framework. And if someone's going to introduce uh, what they're suggesting is, is a new framework, you first have to make the case, why is there a need for a new framework? And so what I'm going to try to convince you of, and I'm actually going to do this more in a, a more brief way than I usually do because I'm saving time for other things. What I'm going to try to convince you of is that there's a critical and specific knowledge gap in the field. That's been one reason why we have not done better. So when you think about the kinds of variables that uh, we think of as suicide risk factors, you know, the, the usual suspects, quote unquote, I'm sure depression severity or depression and hopelessness come to mind. You can probably think of many others too, uh, different kinds of mental health diagnoses, um, you know, eating disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders. Those, those are all uh, the kinds of things we think about. What I'm going to show you now is relevant to all of them. I'm just not going to use 10 slides to do it today. So what we have on the left are three variables. Depression measured two different ways. One is a dimension that could be high or lower, another as presence or absence of a depressive disorder. We also have hopelessness there. And on the right, you see a comparison that we're going to look at, ideators versus non-suicidal. What that means is for this analysis right here, we're comparing people who have seriously considered suicide to people who have never considered or attempted suicide. So no attempters in this analysis. And the effect sizes that will pop up show you the difference between these groups. And these are Cohen's D values. If you're not familiar with those, uh, zero means there's no group difference. 0.3 is small, 0.5 medium, 0.8 and above large, uh, roughly. So what we see here is not surprising. People who have felt suicidal are much higher on depression and at least uh, moderately higher on hopelessness than people who have never felt suicidal. We're now looking at the same variables, uh, and this is you know, meta-analytic data, so the same pool of studies, except we've switched the comparison at the top. We're now looking at ideators, people who have seriously considered suicide but not attempted, comparing them to people who have actually attempted suicide. And I would argue that this is actually a more critical comparison because suicide ideation itself is relatively common. Most people with ideation don't progress to an attempt. Clinically, the question we're often faced with is, we know that this person thinks about suicide, but when and, and, and uh, might they transition to suicide attempts? And so this is a comparison that's important clinically, important theoretically. It's also the comparison where our prediction drops out. Instead of large group differences for depression and medium, slightly above medium for hopelessness, our uh, effect sizes drop to below 0.3, what would be considered small. In other words, there, the difference between people who attempt suicide and people who consider suicide without attempting uh, is negligible for depression and for hopelessness. And what's taken the field uh, maybe a decade to wrap its mind around, I think, in, at least in the suicidology field, we're getting this now, is that this pattern is relevant to almost every other variable that we think of as a suicide risk factor. And this has been replicated in epidemiological studies in the, in the United States, in epidemiological studies by the World Health Organization in 20 countries, in both adolescents and adults, in meta-analytic data that I, that I like the kind that I just showed you, that attempters and ideators are similar on depression hopelessness, on rates of most mental disorders, on measures of psychological pain, on measures of belongingness and burdensomeness, even on impulsivity. And the impulsivity finding is something that we found accidentally when, I, when gosh, over 10 years ago, I thought, wow, no one has showed what's obvious, that people who have uh, attempted suicide will be higher on trait measures of impulsivity than people who think about suicide but don't attempt. I'll, we'll just you know, do that nice, easy, straightforward paper to demonstrate what's true, and it, it didn't work. We looked at another sample with uh, four measures of impulsivity. It didn't, it didn't work. We then found out that someone else at the same time was doing the same work, and they published a, a similar paper that we hadn't seen. And then we also learned that people have done work showing that not only is what I'm saying true, but that if you actually look at the impulsivity of an attempt, right, we can think of suicide attempts themselves, some being more planful or some being more impulsive. There's a lot of ways to quantify that. You know, how, what was the time between the thought and the action? Were there efforts to resist it? Do people report it was impulsive? Any of those quantitative metrics of how uh, impulsive a suicide attempt was has no relationship, it turns out, to how impulsive that person is based on personality measures. So this trait of impulsivity is simply not telling us who attempts, neither are all these other variables, yet all of these other variables on this screen, including impulsivity, are higher in people who consider suicide and in people who have attempted compared to people who've never been suicidal. It's just that they matter for suicidal thoughts, not attempts. 
And this has been replicated over and over and worldwide, and normally I would subject you to at least 10 more slides to make that clear. <laughs> so if we uh, f face this very fundamental question, what do our risk factors tell us? Well, they tell us who develops suicidal ideation, and they do a reasonable job of that, but they do not tell us who acts on suicidal thoughts. And that is something that is largely an undiscovered country right now, though over the last five years, there's been lots of promising perspectives on this, uh, which we'll talk about. So the take home message at this point is that there are separate explanations for who develops suicidal ideation as opposed to who progresses from suicidal ideation to potentially lethal attempts. Um, these are separate processes with separate predictors and separate explanations. And this is the perspective that, that we've given the name ideation to action framework. So when I use that term, this is the perspective I'm referring to. Now, in, from a historical perspective, this perspective is a departure from the kinds of uh, seminal suicide theories we've seen in the field. There's been uh, highly cited theories emphasizing the role of social isolation, emphasizing the role of psychic, which refers to psychological pain, especially when it's unbearable. Uh, escape refers to escape from a particular um, self, a negative self-perception. Uh, hopelessness theories by Beck and elaborated by Am Abramson. What these perspectives have in common is that they've treated suicidality as a single phenomenon in need of a single explanation. And so the ideation action framework is a departure from that traditional kind of perspective. Now the pioneering exception in the theory world uh, was from Thomas Joyner in 2005 when he published his interpersonal theory of suicide. Now, what he said is that you need at least two things to make a potentially lethal suicide attempt. You need the desire for suicide, which it was his term uh, roughly analogous to suicidal ideation, but you also need the capability to make an attempt. Now, he specified what he thought were the specific ingredients that led to desire and capability. So, for example, for desire, he said it was a combination of perceived burdensomeness and low or thwarted belongingness, and that when people experience these in combination, that's what caused desire. My own take is that the evidence is, is mixed or, or not so supportive for that. He also said for capability that uh, what he specifically emphasized was acquired capability. Now, he started from this premise I briefly referenced a moment ago, that attempting suicide is hard even for people who feel suicidal because we are biologically, evolutionarily, deeply wired to avoid pain, avoid death, avoid injury. And those are barriers that must be overcome. The fears of those things must be overcome in order to make an attempt. And so he hypothesized that people can acquire this capability over time in near infinite ways. Any kind of exposure to what he called painful or provocative events could habituate people to pain, injury, so examples could be if there's a physical trauma history, uh, then that person has been forced to cope with physical pain and, and persist through it more than other people. Their capability will be higher. Perhaps eating disorder behaviors like binging, purging, or, or restricting, where people get practice uh, imposing some sort of uh, you know, f uh, physical limitation on their body that comes with um, with uh, some suffering. Um, Non-suicidal self-injury, um, whether or not people realize it, even if someone who self-injures does not feel suicidal, that person is uh, increasing their experience with self-inflicted violence, their capability for that, they're habituating to it, and should they feel suicidal, their ability to progress to an attempt is now greater. So these are examples of acquired capability uh, and, uh, and of Joyner's perspective. Now, the main take-home message that we, that we emphasize from this, though, is not the specifics of the theory, but is the, the, this desire capability framework. And so we're, what we say is he gave the field more than a specific theory. He gave the field a framework that really all of us need to adopt. And, and that um, I see him as sort of, even though he hasn't worded it this way, as sort of like the, the parent of this ideation action framework perspective. Now, this has field-wide implications, and we're not going to get into all of these today. I'm going to give you a taste and then dive into a subset. But this has field-wide implications for how we do research. The typical kind of study you see on suicide is some version of a group with suicide attempts to a group without. And what that model is missing is that anything that seems to be higher in the attempter group might be higher simply because it's a correlate not of attempts, but of ideation, because everyone in that attempter group has had suicidal thoughts. And in fact, when we look at the data carefully, like I have a few slides ago, it turns out that that's the case in almost an, uh, every variable we look at. 
Variables we think predict attempts, they actually predict attempts because they predict ideation, but they do not predict attempts over and above ideation in, in meaningful ways. So at the very least, as we proceed in research, we need to use designs that when we predict attempts, take into account ideation in some way. There's field-wide implications for intervention and prevention. Um, the shortest way to say this is that any intervention or prevention method should be explicit about the aspects meant to reduce suicidal ideation as opposed to the aspects meant to impede progression from ideation to attempts. This is something that we'll get into more uh, when we talk about uh, uh, theory. There's also field-wide implications for risk assessment and conceptualization. So for example, <coughs> the, the typical way that we've seen this over the years is here's a bunch of risk factors for suicide, here's a piece of paper where we list them, or here's the part of the intake form where you, you check them, and there's a lot of them, off you go. And I think most of us feel that this isn't particularly helpful. It's like, okay, they have four. Now what? So from the ideation action framework perspective, at the very least, we should be thinking about risk assessment this way. There are risk factors for development of suicidal ideation. Things like most mental disorders, like depression, like hopelessness, even impulsivity belongs on this side of the framework. At the same time, there's uh, risk factors for progressing from ideation to attempts. This is where we've done a less good job as a field. Now, one thing I think we have done consistently over the, the years or decades is access to lethal means. That's probably a great example of an action variable or a capability variable that we've paid good attention to as a field. This is also where a joiner's acquired capability construct might go. Um, there's a whole universe, though, and that, that we're going to talk more about, about what might go in, in this end of the framework. One small distinction here is you also see expertise in lethal means. And to emphasize how relevant that can be, imagine a scenario where we have two individuals equal on suicidal desire, equal on access to lethal means. Maybe they both have equal access to a firearm. But one person knows how the firearm works, uh, what it feels like to pull the trigger. Another person has never pulled the trigger before. They don't know if there's going to be some sort of recoil. They don't know if they're going to do it right. Their fear of messing up and having it go wrong is going to be a lot higher. And so from this perspective, that second person has, uh, or that first person has much higher capability than the second person, even though, in this example, suicidal desire and access to lethal means are held completely constant. I also think social contagion belongs on the action side of things. I don't think there's evidence that when there's a suicide in a community such as a high school that now more adolescents feel suicidal. I think the evidence is that among the adolescents who feel suicidal but couldn't really ever imagine acting on that, what would it even look like to, to attempt suicide? Now someone just like them has, attempt, has died by suicide and cognitively suddenly this is a more um, accessible outcome. And if they know the method that was used and it's available to them, practically it's a more accessible outcome. And so I think social contagion belongs on this side. Some variables are going to be what um, Barry Walsh, uh, who some of you might know, called double trouble variables. They actually contribute to both risk for ideation and risk for progression to attempts. I think non-suicidal self-injury is an example of that because on the one hand it is a marker for uh, high emotional distress, uh, overwhelming negative feelings that need to be regulated and that's going to be a, a marker for increased risk for feeling suicidal. But as I mentioned, it's also an example of experience and, and habituation to self-inflicted violence. So should someone who self-injures develops a uh, suicidal desire, they're more capable of making that transition. And there'll probably be other double trouble variables as well. Um, Injection uh, drugs like, like heroin use might be another example. So one question that I don't normally address, um, but I figured would be relevant is, well, uh, first, how does borderline personality disorder play into this? Is borderline personality disorder like the other variables in that it doesn't distinguish between attempters and ideators? And so I thought I would share some findings from three different data sets. The first is a large sample of military recruits. And when we compare people who've never been suicidal to people who feel suicidal, we get a very large group difference. These are Cohen's D's again, and one is, is large by almost any, any metric. When we compare ideators to attempters, our prediction drops out. 0.19 is small by any metric. So in this sample, presence of BPD was strongly related to likelihood of feeling suicidal. And of course, that is a very critical first step towards, uh, towards moving towards attempts. But there was not extra information in the BPD, uh, BPD diagnosis about progressing to attempts. Uh, in a large sample of university students, we did a similar comparison and we found similar results. Large prediction of suicidal ideation, small prediction of 
attempts among ideators. We looked at an adolescent sample. Now, if you look on the upper uh, right, you'll notice the sample sizes of people with histories of ideation and attempters are smaller here. Um, and I mentioned that in part because, while well, we do replicate again the strong relationship to feeling suicidal. This time, though, we have some medium prediction or some medium distinction between people, who, adolescents who attempt suicide and adolescents who feel suicidal but don't attempt. And to be totally honest, I don't know how seriously to take that. I don't know if there's something different about adolescents in their experience of BPD traits or if smaller sample sizes just allowed for some statistical noise. But this is the state of my knowledge about how BPD fits into the ideation action framework. Now, to be clear, I'm going to be talking about, with a lot more substance and detail, the second half of the talk, um, how we actually understand suicide in, in, a, in a richer way, and then how BPD fits in. Briefly, though, I'm going to walk us through some of the same data for post-traumatic stress disorder, um, because it turns out to be a mental disorder that has a different story. Um, so this is meta-analytic data, and meta-analytically, when we look at the difference between ideators and people who have never been suicidal, we see a large difference for PTSD. So far, that's similar to virtually every other disorder or variable we've looked at. When we switch to this more critical comparison between attempters and ideators, oh, sorry. First, I'm just putting in context that PTSD relates to ideation similarly to depression and hopelessness, or more than hopelessness, similar to depression. When we switch to the, this uh, critical comparison, PTSD actually uh, maintains a, a somewhat robust uh, effect. Uh, people, having PTSD does increase the chances that among people with ideation, people progress to an attempt. And that's different from depression and hopelessness. Now, we might speculate that this is because people with PTSD are exposed to a lot more, um, whether it's physical pain or other kinds of trauma, um, have more experience uh, having to persist through that not just the original trauma, but the kinds of re, uh, reimagining and, and things that persist well beyond the trauma, and perhaps have a better pain tolerance or distress tolerance that then can help someone with PTSD who feels suicidal overcome those fears of injury, pain, and death and progress to an attempt. This is, the, the data suggests PTSD is a meaningful risk factor for progression to attempts. My explanations are somewhat speculative. So this ideation action framework perspective that Joyner, uh, from my perspective, started in um, 2005 has spawned uh, a new generation of suicide theories. So after Joyner's theory came Rory O'Connor's integrated motivational volitional model, which also offered different explanations for desire and capability, what he called motivation and, and volition. And then the three-step theory of suicide, which is a theory that I published with Alexis May in 2015 and that we've done a lot of work on since. So, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus uh, on the three-step theory of suicide, why I think it's helpful, why I think it's evidence-based, and, and how it helps us move forward. Now, before uh, jumping into the substance of the theory, this is not a slide to convince you that it is a good theory. It's a slide for us to think about what are the minimum requirements for a theory to be considered a good theory. And so I would argue that it must, well, first of all, be positioned within the ideation to action framework, and hopefully that's something that I've convinced you of. But a good theory should also be consistent with the basic behavioral and cognitive principles that have served us very, very well in other areas of, of mental health and psychopathology, whether treating anxiety, depression, um, BPD. Obviously, DBT is very much infused with uh, behavioral and cognitive principles. A good theory of suicide shouldn't sort of stand alone and reinvent the wheel. It should somehow be founded and consistent with these principles. A good theory should also be consistent with the huge literature on known predictors. We could probably list you know, a thousand different predictors or correlates or risk factors for suicide. And it's not helpful if a new theory simply says, well, here's the thousandth and seventeenth. Um, what I think a good theory of suicide should do, it needs to be fully consistent with this huge literature, but use the, this literature, these you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of predictors as clues that can be assembled into a cohesive explanation. Finally, a good theory should be testable. A good theory preferably should also be accurate. And a good theory must achieve a very tricky balance. On the one hand, it has to be broad enough to account for tremendous individual variation. The story of suicide for a 13-year-old boy is not the story of suicide for an 80-year-old widow. On the other hand, though, a, theory, a good theory has to be specific and actionable enough to be useful. So with all that in mind, I have an extra slide for no reason. With all that in mind, uh, I'll actually talk about the three-step theory of suicide and say what it is. Apparently, uh, 
I'm either pressing backwards buttons or had extra slides. In, in the book, is there all these extra weird slides? It's probably my fault. Um, step one addresses when does suicidal, suicidal ideation develop. We say that suicidal ideation develops when two necessary conditions combine, and the first is pain. Usually psychological pain or emotional pain, um, emotional misery, unbearable pain, but not always. Uh, uh, medical pain counts. Um, basically anything that makes life uh, aversive. And we start there uh, for a particular reason, and that is that from uh, birth, this is apparent at a very early age, we are deeply wired to avoid and respond to pain. We are fundamentally creatures of behavioral conditioning. A young child touches a hot stove and they learn very quickly never to do that again. We avoid things that are punished, we seek things that are rewarded. So if someone's experience of life uh, and of living is that it's painful, aversive, miserable, they are essentially being punished for trying to engage with life. And that instinct will kick in, I don't want this anymore. It's, we are also uh, purposefully brought about the source of pain because just like if you think about the very, very basic behavioral studies that established this thing called you know, punishment from a behavioral perspective, if we ask, well, what kind of you know, aversive stimulus can shape behavior and make people want to not do something or avoid something, well, the answer is anything. Electric shock, loud noise, social exclusion. Anything aversive, uh, anything that makes life aversive is, with sufficient intensity or duration or both is going to kick in an instinct, I don't want this anymore. The same instinct that we carry around with us for an infinite number of other things in life. But of course, we're not only cre uh, behavioral creatures. We also have thoughts. And so pain is not sufficient for someone to feel suicidal. If someone is experiencing life as painful but has hope that there's a way out, that you know, I'm in my first year of medical school and it will get better, or if I take such and such steps, things will get better. If they have hope that there's a way to, to reduce or end the pain, their focus is going to be on that, that hope, on achieving that better future. But if someone's experience of life is painful and they're hopeless that there's a way to escape this, this is when they start to feel maybe being alive is not for me. And, and that's why it's the combination that matters. So importantly, this is not an additive statement that two negative things are worse than one. Um, it's the combination that matters. I already explained how pain without hopelessness doesn't lead to feeling suicidal. It leads to feeling I want a way out. You, there's even examples where the reverse is true. So imagine uh, someone who you know, maybe graduates from college, maybe not the most marketable degree, maybe not the best grade point average, and they go back home to live with their parents. This is someone who, if they're asked about their future and what it's going to look like, may have a very hard time imagining it, may not enjoy that, may, may genuinely not know what their future looks like, how are they going to be uh, self-sufficient. Uh, self but if their everyday needs are met, they have food, they have shelter, they have free time, they can hang out with their friends, they're not going to be experiencing pain day to day. So they might score high on measures of hopelessness, but they're not going to be scoring high on measures of pain, at least not yet. And so from the perspective of the theory, they're not going to be feeling suicidal. It's the combination uh, that matters. Step two addresses when does ideation become active or when does it escalate? Most people who feel suicidal spend their time more in a modest kind of suicidal ideation. Sometimes I wonder if I would be better off dead, as opposed to I would kill myself if I had the chance or if I knew how to do it. So step two addresses when, when does ideation escalate? And we suggest that ideation escalates if pain exceeds or overwhelms one's sense of connectedness. And we define connection broadly. Yes, connection can be to people, to, uh, to loved ones, to family, to friends, but connection can be to a role, to an interest, a job, a project. Um, any sense of purpose or meaning that keeps someone invested in life counts as connection. <coughs> so if someone's connection to life is greater than their pain, then they will still, from our perspective, have some of this modest ideation. Sometimes I wonder if I would be better off dead but their ideation will stay more modest, as it typically does, because there's something in their life that, that's making it uh, worth living. But sometimes pain is either too great, or sometimes pain is so great that it removes our ability to appreciate connections that we otherwise have. Um, I don't know if this is the best example, because I think when we, those of us who've experienced food poisoning forget how bad it is. But if you try to remember what it's like, it's just absolutely awful. You can't enjoy anything. All you're doing is surviving. You can't appreciate joking around with friends or with, or with loved ones. You can't appreciate being engaged with your job. You're just surviving till the pain ends so you can enjoy those things again. But what if the pain didn't go away? 
even if uh, before this happened, you had you know, wonderful connections to whatever it is that was meaningful to you, people, job, role, you know, whatever it was, you can, pain can overwhelm your ability to, to uh, appreciate that. And so if that happens, that's when we say ideation escalates and people start to think that, that suicide is actually a realistic option they're considering. They're in pain, they're hopeless about it getting better, and there's nothing keeping them uh, that, that's making the pain worth it. Um, Audrey Pott is a girl who died by suicide in 2012 in uh, British Columbia, Canada, where um, I'm usually based. And her last Facebook post was public and gives an example of how these ingredients uh, can combine. She wrote, I am in hell. I can't do anything to fix it. The whole school knows I have a reputation I can never get rid of. Step three of the theory addresses when does ideation lead to action. And we say that strong ideation progresses to action when there is the capacity or the capability to make an attempt. And so we're actually starting at the same point that Thomas Joyner starts. We agree uh, fully that acquired capability is something that's, that's real and legitimate. People can experience various kinds of painful and provocative events that over time increase their ability to habituate to and to tolerate uh, the kinds of pain and fear that are, that are barriers to attempting suicide. But we also expand this, this construct. We suggest that there's also dispositional contributors to, to ca uh, capability for suicide. Some people are simply born more or less uh, pain tolerant. Some people are born more or less squeamish of things like blood or injury. Um, some people are born more or less harm avoidant. Uh, there was a study that came out a couple years ago that wasn't designed to look at suicide, but they happened to measure suicide ideation in attempts, and they found something that on the surface was curious. Um, I forget if the specific me measure was neuroticism, which is a personality trait referring to negative uh, emotions, basically, negative, uh, the, ex the experience of negative emotions, or if it was actually harm avoidance. Um, uh, empirically and conceptually, it turns out those are very much aligned. And what they found, uh, they found a, a sort of a, a double pattern, the first of which made sense. If you were higher on harm avoidance or on negative emotionality, you were more likely to say that you've considered suicide at some point. But what they found is that among the pool of people who had a history of feeling suicidal, if you were higher on harm avoidance, negative emotionality, you were less likely to have made an attempt. And on the surface, that can be very confusing. But from the perspective of, of, the, of the theory, it makes sense that to the extent we look at harm avoidance or neuroticism as, as, a, as a temperament, this is disposing people to have life be more aversive and, and maybe feel, be more likely to feel suicidal, but it is also making it harder to transition to an actual suicide attempt. And so I think that's one way to understand their data. There's also uh, practical contributors to capability. Access to lethal means is the example I think people are most familiar with. I acknowledge earlier knowledge and comfort with lethal means and how that might come into play. Um, this is a universe that we have not sufficiently explored, uh, and there's so many examples of where this perspective can help us understand something clinically or theoretically. One example is that um, there's some data that anesthesiologists uh, have higher suicide rates, and that often leads people to think, you know, what's, what's more miserable about their lives? You know, maybe they wanted to be like real doctors or surgeons, and they got stuck being anesthesiologists. And, and I think that's an example of, of thinking on the wrong end of the ideation action framework. What they're thinking is why their desire is higher. I think what's probably most likely here is that anesthesiologists, whether or not they realize it, are walking around with exquisite capability for suicide. They have knowledge of drugs that are lethal. They have knowledge of drugs that reduce pain and negative emotion. They have access to these drugs and expertise. And so I think that's an example of what's happening. Um, another example of how this might come into play is that um, maybe a 14-year-old girl is feeling suicidal but her, her capability is very low for a variety of reasons. When we're younger, it's hard to even imagine acting on suicidality relative to adults. It's hard to imagine what it might look like. But what if she goes on the internet, Googles, and learns that Tylenol is lethal in overdose, but ibuprofen is not? From our perspective, her practical capability just went up uh, quite high. So these are some examples of how we can think about practical capability in, in daily life. Um, one more example, which, which has a little more maybe clinical resonance, let's, uh, resonance, let's say you have a client who um, has a history of feeling suicidal, maybe not currently, and in session they say, you know, the other day I was feeling uh, kind of sentimental, sort of thinking about the world and my role in it, and I kind of walked to this bridge, and it happens to be a bridge where people sometimes die by suicide uh, by jumping off. And she says, I went to the edge, I looked at the sky, I thought about what it all means, I looked over the edge, and, you know, and then I walked home. 
Now, I think what we will do in that case is immediately, like, are you feeling suicidal? And often if they say, no, I'm fine, you know, I'm not at all, it was just a sentimental moment, you know, we sort of calm down, we document, we move on. From a capability perspective, what we have to realize is this person just increased their capability for suicide. It's now in their behavioral repertoire to walk to this bridge. And perhaps they've even, by looking over the edge, which, you know, we can all imagine the butterflies, they've taken a step where they've now maybe habituated to getting one step away from jumping. So should this, people, should this person feel suicidal in the future, their practical capability is now higher. We should both recognize that and maybe take a step such as incorporating it into their safety plan. I'm glad you're feeling, you know, you're feeling safe. I'm glad you're not feeling suicidal. Should it happen in the future you know, that you find yourself feeling suicidal and walking to the bridge, you know, what are some steps that might be some you know, things we should have ready for you? Something along those lines. So those are just some examples of how this universe of practical capability, I think, is something we need to uh, understand better, apply better. So step three, when does ideation lead to action? When there is the, the, total, uh, the total capability to make an attempt, uh, make an attempt possible. If so, then ideation leads to action. So here is all of this in, in one slide. Are you in pain and hopeless? And yes, I do get made fun of for how rudimentary this looks. Step one, are you in pain and hopeless? If yes, you'll develop suicidal ideation. If no, you will not. Step two, does your pain exceed or overwhelm your connectedness? If yes, your ideation escalates. Step three, do you have the, the capability to make a suicide attempt? If yes, you will uh, transition to a potentially lethal attempt. If not, you will remain among the majority of people who feel suicidal but don't progress to an attempt. So I have to make some choices now. I have nine more minutes and, and then we have time for questions. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the evidence and then I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, evidence for step one, I think at this point is strongest. The theory was proposed four years ago, so evidence is accumulating. Step one says the combination of pain and hopelessness leads to suicidal ideation. Now, if I'm going to convince you of, of that or have a hope to, I can't just show you data that pain and hopelessness relate to suicidal ideation. Obviously they do. So does everything else on this slide. What I need to show you at the very least is that pain, measures of pain and hopelessness stand out among this larger universe of things that matter. And so I think they stand out in a couple different ways that I'm going to show you. First, uh, we developed a measure several years back of motivations for suicide attempts. Our idea was, huh, there's lots of theories of suicide. They emphasize different motivations. There isn't a single measure that captures these different motivations uh, in a psychometrically valid way. Let's do that. You can see the motivations that are assessed on the left, things like uh, hopelessness, I attempted suicide because I felt more hopeless than I ever have because of overwhelming pain. You see um, belongingness and burdensomeness uh, in the middle. You see things of um, attempting suicide for help seeking and interpersonal influence on the bottom. This first set of data is from community outpatients, um, adults. And what we see is that the highest endorsement was, was for hopelessness and overwhelming pain relative to these other things that are also emphasized in various theories. All right, interesting finding. We then looked at this in undergraduates who reported a history of suicide attempts, and we found the same thing. Overwhelming pain and hopelessness were at the top. We then looked at this in adult psychiatric patients in collaboration with some colleagues at, at Brown University. We again found that pain and hopelessness were at the top. We then looked at this in an online sample of uh, a US based but a quite diverse sample through Amazon's Mechanical Turk platform. We again found that pain and hopelessness were at the top. We then looked at adult psychiatric inpatients in Vancouver who had been hospitalized in the, in the past week for suicide attempts. And we again found that pain and hopelessness were at the top in terms of motivations. So that's one type of evidence that there's something different about pain and hopelessness. Only pain and hopelessness were near universal motivations for suicide attempts, no matter where we looked, community, clinical, adult, adolescent. Other motivations sometimes also mattered. But when they were present, they were present in conjunction with pain and hopelessness, not without. Now, more evidence from step one came from a study that Matthew Winterstein did um, actually several years ago as, as a prelude to a meeting by, uh, hosted by the United States government to develop youth warning signs for suicide. <coughs> and what he did in advance is he uh, examined two groups, adolescents hospitalized for a suicide attempt and loved ones who had lost adolescents to suicide. And he wanted to ask them what was different in the minutes, hours, and days leading up to the suicide attempt or the suicide death. Now, what, what did he ask them about? What he did was um, he, is, he ended up pooling 42 variables that he asked people about, were, you know, were these things different? 
And these were nominated by the 20 to 25 experts that were invited to this uh, US government coordinated effort to develop youth warning signs for suicide. We all in advance got to nominate one, two, or three things that we thought would matter. We hadn't put our theory out yet, but we had a sense that pain and hopelessness seemed to be what was resonating with people, so we submitted our items. But here are examples of some of the other items that people said would be different in the minutes, hours, days leading up to an attempt or a suicide death. There would be more social withdrawal, agitation would be apparent, more sleep problems would be, would be reported or apparent. There would be more family conflict, more anger, hostility, more guilt, shame. Well, the, the way the results came out is that across the two groups, pulling across the two groups, the two most commonly endorsed answers were emotional misery or pain, feelings of hopelessness about the future. So more evidence to us that the, these are standing out, even among other things that obviously might matter. Finally, to address that, it really is the combination that matters. We made a very pretty picture. It's not even that pretty. Um, what you see in this graph on the left side is mean level of suicidal ideation as assessed by the, um, uh, uh, I forget, the, the Beck measure. Beck suicide, BSI, um, yeah, Beck suicidal, that one, thank you. What a weird thing to forget. What you see, now we actually did this analysis the right way. The, the way we're picturing it in sort of a categorical way is just for illustration purposes, but it's not how we analyze the data. Um, and we're simply showing that when you divide people into three groups, well, on the left is a group of people who scored low on both measures of pain and hopelessness, and it turns out their suicidal ideation was negligible. But the middle group is going to be kind of the interesting one. What if, you have, what if you're above average on pain but not hopelessness or vice versa? Um, from our perspective, your ideation should, should stay negligible, and we found data that I think are mostly consistent with that. It's only in the combination group on the right where we see suicidal ideation. Now, there's some evidence for step two, there's some evidence for step three, um, and there's been some replications of this evidence in the, in the UK, in Canada, and in China. The first two groups I was a part of, this, the latter group, um, they just did it on their own. Um, the evidence, to be totally straightforward, uh, you know, well, of course also subjective, is stronger for step one than the other steps, mainly because the other steps haven't been looked at so much. But I want to move on from evidence so I can talk about implications in my remaining time. Why is the theory promising? I think the theory is promising because it offers a concept conceptually sensible explanation. I think it's promising because it's fully consistent with the very large body of existing research implicating things like emotional pain, hopelessness, disconnection, and capability. Um, but it assembles this into a cohesive explanation. It's also fully consistent with the basic behavioral and cognitive principles that have served us very well in other domains. It, it, it's very much founded on some of these principles. It's testable. It's so far accurate. And it also has clear implications for research and prevention. So one way I think it's useful for research, but also just general understanding, is as an organizing model for understanding suicide risk. So you see the, uh, the, the three-step theory variables on the top there. When we say that these are the variables that matter, we are not saying that nothing else matters. Hundreds of things matter. But what we are saying is these are the, the, the mechanisms, these are the pathways through which they matter. So if we have this overwhelming list of hundreds or thousands, this literature of the various kinds of predictors and risk factors, we can impose some organization and meaning on it. So for example, uh, literature on things like psychic, psychological pain, th the roles of depression and suicide risk, anxiety, emotion dysregulation, most mental disorders, distress, those matter, but probably chiefly through their contribution to pain. The Beck hopelessness literature, pessimistic outlooks, uh, learned helplessness, possibly even self-efficacy and, and reduced future orientation in people who report suicidal ideation. Those things, they still matter, but they probably matter chiefly through their contribution through hopelessness. Social isolation, loneliness, poor social support, low belongingness, burdensomeness probably make their contributions chiefly through connectedness. Uh, capability is where we see the contribution of things like access to means, acquired capability, other forms of capability, knowledge of means. And so this is an example of how we might, instead of having this overwhelming literature of hundreds of things, we can understand that yes, they matter, but here's, here's why they matter. Now also to be clear, these things are of course not genuinely siloed. Anything that increases hopelessness, well that's, a very, that's an aversive state that might be painful. Sudden disruptions to connection might also be painful. Um, so of course these things can influence each other. The theory allows that, but it does not require it. Now, this is, what I'm gonna show you now is, are just some ideas. You can, uh, most people here, all people here can fill this out better than I can. But if we wanna understand suicide risk in different kinds of populations, the theory might also provide a, a, a lens for doing that. 
So for example, for borderline personality disorder, we might understand how some of the key features of BPD, like emotional instability, negative emotions in general, intense anger, stress-related uh, paranoia dissociation, shame, um, contribute to suicide risk in BPD in large part through pain. Chronic emptiness and identity instability. Now, chronic emptiness is also quite aversive, so that could easily be in, in, in pain as well. But there's also a way where if you're feeling chronically empty and, and having trouble with identity stability, it's harder to envision the future. Um, and so those might also contribute through hopelessness. Um, a lot of the key symptoms we, we see in our interpersonal instability, abandonment, maybe chronic emptiness as well, um, just because I've sometimes heard people with emptiness describe it as a disconnection from others, but that's not how everyone describes it. These BPD features might make their contribution to suicide risk chiefly through connectedness. And of course, people with BPD on average are more likely to experience self-injury and more likely to experience various kinds of, uh, to have experienced painful and provocative events in their life that could habituate them to, uh, to pain and injury and, and death and increase capability. This, this graph is not meant to be authoritative, it's meant to be illust illustrative. Similarly, in PTSD, we could look out, uh, you could, we could understand PTSD's core symptoms through a similar lens, how re-experiencing self-anger and blame, arousal agitation might contribute to suicide risk by making life painful, that just the sheer persistence of symptoms not going away can make people feel hopeless, as well as any self-directed anger or blame that might make, feel, make someone feel less efficacious for making their future better. Feeling detached from others, having difficulty experiencing positive emotions, avoidance that might include avoidance of socially meaningful kinds of things could increase risk through connectedness. And the, probably the reason why PTSD stands out among mental diagno uh, uh, psych psychiatric diagnoses for actually being more common in attempters compared to ideators is because it does come with ex increased experience in ex uh, with pain, injury, and death. So th these are some ways that the theory might be applied to diagnostic populations we care about, but they can also be applied to sociocultural contexts and, and other kinds of uh, contexts and populations. Uh, finally, I think the theory, uh, a useful feature of the theory is that if we want to reduce suicide risk, we have four clear targets for intervention. No matter the level of intervention, individual, uh, school, community, population, if we want to reduce suicide risk, the theory says we will succeed to the extent that we can reduce pain increase hope, improve connection, and or reduce uh, capability for suicide. And so from, from the theory's perspective, any intervention is going to be successful through one or more of these pathways. And if an intervention does not modify these pathways, it will not be successful. This is, of course, testable. Another way to think about this is that these would be the mediators or the mechanisms of reduced suicide risk in a treatment like DBT. Um, I mentioned that there could be multiple levels of intervention. Um, I think the pu pu uh, population public health one is underutilized and is a direction that suicide preventionists are moving in. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you to people who've supported the work or collaborated in the work. And hopefully I've saved at least some time for questions. Thank you. I have a stack of questions here for you. I'm actually going to start with a compliment that came in from an audience member. This audience member writes, as a consumer who attempted suicide many years ago, I want to thank you for giving me a deep understanding that brings me clarity rather than fear and shame. Your work resonates with me and is valid for my experiences. Thank you. And that is from a consumer in the audience somewhere sitting out here. Thank you for sharing that, whoever you are. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that. I have a number of other questions for you. One is, can you elaborate a little bit on your operational definition of capacity for suicidal action? The writer says, you know, most of us are aware of actions that could cause our death. Could you just stretch that out a little bit for us? Yeah, the, the, so about how do we define or measure or, uh, um, capability for suicide. The word capacity appeared there because originally we were distinguishing our elaborated version from Joyner's acquired capability. It turns out he's also expanded his own perspective in recent years, so now I'm back to using capability because I think we actually see it the same way now. Um, we are trying to measure capability variable, the pro uh, uh, capability better. The problem with it is that there's infinite versions of capability. So I think it's useful to think about it in terms of how there can be some dispositional variables or contributors and acquired ones through experience and practical ones. Um, and there, we are collaborating with some people to try to make a comprehensive measure. But I also think that it's a little bit like um, 
Well, if we find the concepts of uh, punishment and reward useful, that when, when you know, something aversive happens in response to something we do, we want to do it less, or if something rewarding happens, we want to do it more, if we find that useful, it's similar in that there's not going to be a comprehensive measure of all the relevant rewards or all the relevant punishments. Um, we can't do that. There's just too many, and they're too idiosyncratic. And in fact, what's a, what's a punisher or a reward for one person or in one context won't be in another. Um, but being aware that that's how humans operate, or at least that's one important way that humans operate, is still incredibly useful in, in everything we do that's relevant to psychology. And I think capability might be similar. So on the one hand, we have a six-item measure where we try to get a, you know, an estimate of the broad range of capability. I have a colleague who's developing like an 80-item measure to try to be super comprehensive. But I'm not entirely convinced that it's going to be about giving a certain measure um, it might be more like how we would treat reward and punishment, or you know, to use a physics analogy, we can understand well the impact of certain forces on objects, and that's incredibly useful in a million ways, but we can't catalog all the sources of forces and, you know, like, well, wind and pushing and, you know, gravity. Uh, so that's the best answer I have right now. Would the answer, if we were to ask you the same question about pain, be similar? There, there was a similar question about there are so many types of pain. Are there specific kinds? I think that's important to recognize that there's so many kinds of pain because I think even the basic literature uh, tells us that it doesn't matter the kind of pain as long as it's conditioning the person to not want to do the thing anymore. That's what matters. And so I actually think it's maybe been a mistake in some prior theories to try to say it's this kind of pain or that kind of pain. It depends on the person. For some people, it might very well be a sense of disconnection and not belonging. But for another person, it might be chronic medical pain um, that every day is miserable because of this condition they have and it's not going to get better. And they're at a point where they're so miserable every day that they can't even appreciate the connections they have, and that's some, that person might want to end their life. And so you know, pain means different things to different people. And I think it's important to, to appreciate that and to be open to that. So what I think is helpful is I think the first part of the first step of the theory can focus us. If someone says they're feeling suicidal, we can start by saying, in most cases, that's something that people feel when they're experiencing intense pain and they're hopeless about it getting better. You know, what for you is the pain? Now, that said, we do have a three-item measure of people simply reporting that, uh, you know, things like, my pain makes me feel like I'm falling apart. That seems to perform really, really well for a three-item measure. And so it's still just based on people's reports of experiencing overwhelming pain. It doesn't tell us, you know, how is overwhelming pain different from other pain? Is overwhelming pain the result of more negative emotions, certain negative emotions, more negative events, certain negative events? Those are important questions that we don't know the answer to. But even people's reports on a very brief measure of overwhelming pain uh, end up uh, predicting very strongly uh, how they're feeling uh, in terms of desire for suicide. I want to go back to your thought on sort of implications for intervention. This question asks about, you know, if expertise with lethality increases the likelihood that somebody will make a suicide attempt, what are the implications for us for populations like veterans, for example, who have, by, by nature of their training, expertise? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question uh, because when we think about capability and what increases it, um, things like participation in the military do that. Access to firearms, expertise in firearms, um, in the U.S., households that own firearms have suicide rate that's three to five times higher than households that do not own a firearm, even though rates of mental illness are not higher. And this is because, well, first of all, it's because suicide is not just about mental disorders. Suicide, from my perspective, is about pain and hopelessness, and, uh, for starters, and there's a lot of ways to get there. Struggling with a psychiatric condition can be one of them, but it's just one. And uh, there's some data suggesting that fire, that I forget the exact figure, but it's something like one-third of firearm suicides in the United States are people who are in the middle of an argument, got to a point that was so aversive, and they went and got a firearm and took their life. And so I think part of the implications of the theory is if you understand the time course of things like pain and hopelessness, those can be very chronic and stable, but they can also peak and ebb and flow on short time scales. And that's also a reason why suicide sometimes seems impulsive but that's a hollow explanation that doesn't fit with the data. What happens is, is that sometimes pain and hopelessness can peak very fast, and people end up making attempts that they, they didn't know they were going to be experiencing spikes of pain and hopelessness earlier in the day or the week. Um, so in terms of uh, veterans, so uh, means safety, which seems to be a, a better term than means restriction, can be very important for veterans or folks in law enforcement or the military. 
And it doesn't have to be, you know, once you get, especially in the US, when you get into taking someone's firearm away, that can get very dicey political. You can get at resistance fast. But if it's used in a mean safety lens, you know, if you're struggling, can, uh, can a, a trusted person hold on to your firearm for you? Kind of like when, we, you know, we take someone's keys if they're drunk to keep them safe. We're not taking their car away. We're not restricting their autonomy. We're just taking care of them. There's some people suggesting that that framework, that approach might be useful. So we want to keep in mind with veterans or other folks who have higher capability practically or through experience, their capability is higher. And there's some practical steps we can take like mean safety, like safety planning that wouldn't apply to other people. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Klonski again. Can we give him a second round of applause? Thank you. And I would like to invite the rest of our presenters today up to the stage. We'll end our day with our panel discussion. So those of you who have spoken today, please come on up. I have stacks of questions for all of you. Thank you all for being here. This is really such a treat. I have an initial question, actually, again for Dr. Klonsky. Should we expect, or could we anticipate, an increase in suicide death, given that there has been some move to restrict opioid prescriptions? The writer um, indicates that lots of people have chronic pain, don't have a viable alternative. Their pain is going up. Their prescriptions are being taken away um, by your theory. Thank you so much, Todd. Hello? Um, thanks. I don't know, uh, because I could see opposing forces. Um, you know, I'm not an opioid expert, um, opiate expert, um, and they're clearly overprescribed. They're clearly causing people to develop addictions that end up damaging their life, uh, damaging their lives that otherwise wouldn't have happened. And so that's a really positive force that they're restricted. On the other hand, if there's people who are now going to live in chronic pain because there's no alternative, um, then yes, we would predict that for those people, uh, their day-to-day -day quality of life, can, if it becomes aversive and miserable and, and, they, and they, they run out of hope that there's an alternative for managing it, then that could increase suicide risk. So from a population perspective, it could go either way. I might even guess that on balance it's a good thing because opio op opioid addiction is so uh, common and, and so horrible and also captures a lot of people who would never have developed an addiction otherwise. Um, but the concern is, is valid, and I think uh, evidence-based theory would suggest that those folks who cannot manage their pain when that option is taken away will be at increased risk. Thank you. Dr. Cousins, this question is for you. You gave us such a beautiful talk about your family and your daughter. The question here is, would you comment on whether your daughter changed her identity from transgender back to female, and did her treatment in borderline personality disorder help her to sort of unfold on this journey? On? Oop, okay. It's not quite. I thought I did that. Okay, it just needs to be closer. Okay, uh, she did not change her uh, her identity from transgender. She would still identify as uh, under the transgender umbrella. Um, she probably would be more specific now in saying that she's gender rejecting or gender neutral. Um, as it turned out, she sort of uh, left us with this information just before she went to wilderness. And um, we kept saying like, oh, we'd really like to talk about this because like we just have a lot, you know, it seems like there's a lot to process here. And um, the whole time she was in wilderness and then different people, but this same message, the whole time she was in residential, they were like, she's not ready because she's so rageful that you can't have a discussion with her right now like we need to deal with that behavior before we can have a conversation about this so it turned out that it was uh when she came home that we started to try to hash this out and actually we had been using male pronouns then uh for many months and um 
So what hap what ha kind of our story is just a unique story, but what happened is as she um, began to date her boyfriend, then fiance, then then hu now husband, um, she started to say things like, "Well, I'm not, I'm not actually sure if I feel comfortable like being called." Like, what would I be called? Like, his wife, his husband, like, how would that work? And I would just say, like, you know what? You'll live into the answer. You'll, you'll figure out what's right for you. And, um, and so that sort of evolved and I think is probably still evolving. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a question here I'm hoping a few of you will weigh in on. Um, the question is, well, in, when an individual with BPD and trauma is in treatment, um, are there elements of PTSD, perhaps underdiagnosed, that can impact progress of treatment um, of borderline personality disorder? And I was wondering, actually, Ms. Ramos, if you might be willing to share with us a little bit about this experience for you. Um, I'm, I'm imagining you might have thoughts about this. Um, so the, the question is how... Um, how did, uh, how could, um, perhaps underdiagnosed or unrecognized components of one's reaction to trauma or PTSD be impeding you in your treatment for borderline personality disorder? Um, I mean, in my case, I, my, I had been diagnosed with PTSD, so I, I mean, I didn't, that, that wasn't my personal experience. Um, I mean, I think from what I've, from what I've read, the statistic is that around 30 to 50 percent of individuals with BPD have or meet criteria for PTSD, um, it's possible that that's actually, there are actually more mm -hmm. individuals mm -hmm. with um, BPD who have PTSD. It's just either not diagnosed or they haven't shared, they haven't disclosed. Um, so, I mean, I can imagine, I can imagine that that would be difficult. I think doing DB, I think doing trauma work before doing DBT is absolutely impossible. Um, I don't know how much, uh, how much undiagnosed PTSD would affect actual DBT work. I'm not, that I don't know. I'd be interested to know though. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else have a thing they'd like to weigh in on on this topic? Um, I could say a few things I agree with you that I mean I think the main thing that first came to mind is when it's not um, assessed for PTSD is not assessed for so it's not diagnosed potentially um, and it is quite um, common actually to not assess for PTSD just sort of routinely screen everybody um, for PTSD and so I think that would be an important thing to make sure is happening um, as well as just to not restrict our diagnosing of PTSD to the types of trauma defined in the DSM because you'll miss a lot of important information about um, post-traumatic stress reactions um, as we've heard from several of us on that particular topic. Um, and if you're not sort of conceptualizing PTSD so much as part of the package, I mean, some of the, someone asked when I was up here before about sort of the overlap between PTSD and um, borderline personality disorder, and I think a big way we see that is um, with emotion dysregulation um, and some of the PTSD and trauma reactions um, really making emotion reactivity bigger and stronger and all that kind of stuff. And if um, some of the research is, you know, if you don't treat their PTSD, that the B BPD symptoms remain more severe, and it's because the emotion dysregulation um, also remains more severe. So sort of making sure we're aware of that link between the emotional reactivity and dysregulation and trauma as a potential cause of that. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I, I agree with that uh, screening for assessment and PTSD should be much more common practice than it is today. I'll also add a little nuance in there that that is not going to be the end all solution to that. Um, I wish I could say that I hadn't had any patients describe to me their most impactful trauma after they completed PTSD treatment, but it has happened numerous, numerous times. Um, so in some ways it's part readiness, um, and that's a question that we really don't have a good understanding of. Um, folks are ready to divulge traumatic experiences or come into their own awareness of them at varying time points, and we don't have perfect control of that. I have a question for Dr. Williams. Um, 
You were speaking so eloquently about the numerous things that wouldn't necessarily meet criterion A that can cause true traumatic reactions, particularly in communities of color and in people who've been historically marginalized. Are there ways in which you'd advocate for expanding criterion A, and if so, in what ways? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think that, I mean, honestly, I think criterion A should be a guideline but not a requirement because there are just so many different ways people can become traumatized. And I think that anything that happens to a person that's really very unexpected and, and extremely painful has the potential to be traumatic. So, um, so you know, that's, that's the way I would like to see things go. But I would also like to see um, racism and oppression specifically mentioned and recognized um, because it is something that's so common and it's something that's often not on clinicians' radar. And so I'm hoping that the work and the research that I'm doing will make that, um, you know, will make that a more um, viable conversation, particularly as we look at DSM-6 or whatever's to come. So. Thank you. Okay, I see some applause about that. Um, so I have a specific question about the DBT-PE protocol for you, Dr. Harned. Um, several questions came in about whether how you arrived at that two-month mark for determining two months free from suicide and self-harm behavior is the standard. And some, some questions were like, is that too long? Some questions were it was too short. If, could you just elaborate for us? How did you arrive at that two month mark? Yeah, sure. Um, that's the trouble with making one objective rule is then um, <laughs> there's lots of different opinions about it, totally understandably. Um, so I can tell you that when um, we first started, um, Marsha was of the opinion uh, that it should be eight months. Um, that that was sort of the sort of how long it would take to really consider someone stable enough to have moved out of stage one and move into stage two, um, and we thought there's just no way. Uh, obviously, we can get through a one-year treatment if we have to wait eight months um, at a minimum to start. Um, so we pushed it back to four months is where we started, um, and then I sort of whittled it down um, to two months based on uh, the sort of criterion I was using was how many people, once they started the DBTPE part of it, were relapsing back into self-harming behaviors of one sort or another. Um, and the answer is, if we have that two-month um, window, it's about 25% uh, or so of people will end up self-harming again um, during DBTPE. So it's not that it doesn't happen at all. Uh, but what I did was go look at data from just standard DBT um, and looking at how many people during their year of standard DBT got two months free from all forms of self-harm and suicidal behavior, and of them, how many relapsed some point later in, relapsed later in that treatment year and did it again after having two months without doing it, and the answer was more like 40-something percent. Um, you know, so our sort of rate when you add in the um, trauma treatment wasn't increasing the likelihood of relapsing. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where we landed. Um, we felt like less than that felt, you know, subjectively a little dicey, but, you know, we didn't go lower, so I don't know. Um, I do want to highlight um, that there are other, there's one person, Martin Bohus, and his treatment approach, um, which he calls DBT for PTSD, where they will start um, the trauma-focused portion of that treatment while people are still actively self-harming. Um, as long as they have not been suicidal or made a suicide attempt um, for a long time, uh, more than four months, I think. Um, so there is one treatment approach that is doing this with people who are still self-harming. So far, his data on that is um, he's only done that within the context of a residential program, which was um, really actually an inpatient unit in a hospital um, so there was sort of a lot more opportunity to kind of monitor um, people and help them with coaching and things like that 24-7 um, than an outpatient model. But he's also trying outpatient now. We just don't have the, the data yet on that. So, Dr. Klonsky, this one's for you. Um, there's a question about the greater rates of suicide in people who are of racial and ethnic minority backgrounds and people who might be transgender. And the question is, um, whether that is due to greater rates of pain in those communities, greater rates of lethal capability, other, it may be speculation at this point, but your thoughts on this? Yeah, I have a response. It is in the category of speculation, so you know, I don't want to represent it as fully evidence-based. Um, 
you know, one thing that I didn't get to say, but that is f fully true about the theory, is that it's not just individual level factors that matter. Con context matters. Um, you know, to bring an example that's not related to the immediately related to the question after. 9/11 in the U.S. You know, so a, a terrible event that affected a lot of thousands of people negatively. Uh, suicide rates w went down for, in the months after, and you know, a best guess about that is that there was an, there was an unparalleled sense of shared purpose and community in the country after that. That was very protective. So you know, contextual, uh, so socio-cultural level factors matter. Now, if you're from a, a mi minority group, the more that minority group is not accepted, is um, you know, experiences uh, you know, prejudice. Um, and even more than that, they don't get to see examples of people like them succeeding in life. That's going to affect pain, hopelessness, and connection. Um, it's, you're going to be going through life with a lot more painful experiences uh, because if you don't get to see models of people like yourself having positive outcomes in society, you're going to feel hopeless about a future, and you're going to struggle with connection um, because a lot of folks are just not, are not going to respond to you the way that they should because for whatever reason... Um, as a species, we suffer with empathy, and I, I don't know how to make us get better at that. Um, there, I think there's signs that over the you know this generations we're getting slowly better, um, but there's a long way to go. So all of them. Now the one thing I didn't mention is capability. There's nothing that comes to mind that capa capability would be automatically higher, but certainly all, all those contributors to suicidal desire will be higher, and probably explains the, the much higher rates of suicide. So I have another question for the panel at large. Um, the question is about the issue in the BPD diagnostic criteria of el that element of identity confusion, questions about who one is, and how that overlaps in your clinical experience or perhaps in your research with individuals who are transgender. How can we square these things, one being a state of being and the other being a diagnostic criterion for something that we call a disorder? How can we make sense of this? Somebody bite on this, please. Okay, sure. So if in the BPD diagnostic criterion we have this, this element that says, you know, a person with BPD may be a person who experiences identity confusion and unstable sense of self, and there also is this phenomenon that happens for some people where they feel like they are in the wrong body, and that is what we call transgender. How can we make sense of these? Um, because we don't think of transgender as being a disorder, right? And yet it is also something that comes up in our diagnostic criterion. How can we understand this? Well, how can we make sense of this? Yeah. It's a tough question, isn't it? Um, and I, I felt compelled to, to bring it up. This would be a really interesting topic for a future conference, I'm imagining. I, mean, I, would, I would say people with borderline personality disorder, they feel unstable in a lot of different areas of their identities, um, sexuality and, and gender identity being one of many different areas where they may struggle. Um, my niece uh, struggled very much uh, with, with borderline, and she's... Um, German American and um, and biracial, and this was part of the focus of her struggle uh, by nature of the illness that she had. So, so I think it shouldn't be surprising if people with borderline are, are struggling in all of these facets of their identities. I, I I will in no way attempt to answer the question. I will add a slight bit of context, though, that the DSM is accepted by basically no one as perfect. Um, at, at, at the foremost of that, uh, at, at the foremost of that is the National Institute of Mental Health, which has basically thrown the book in the trash uh, in, in favor of starting from basic science again. But I will say this, that there's also historical context to this. So if we think back to DSM-2, homosexuality was a psychiatric disorder. If we think back further than that, actually being a runaway slave was a psychiatric disorder. So I would say that there's historical context to this and that the DSM is imperfect. In terms of differentiating that out, I defer. Thank you. I have another question that may be relevant for you, Dr. Lee, and you, Dr. Klonsky. The question is, can emotion dysregulation, using your definition of sort of brief, um, you know, thinking about emotion being a brief phenomenon, increase the capacity for suicide? For example, a sudden spike of dispositional factors in an acute event. Your thoughts on this? <laughs> 
I'm not, I'm not sure what the last phrase means, the spike in uh, emotional dis um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't. Now, I know that we are just starting as a field to see what appear to be counterintuitive patterns of emotion dysregulation or, or distress tolerance or emotional reactivity. We sometimes are good at distinguishing these things, sometimes we're not. Um, I gave one example uh, that, that was relevant earlier about neuroticism and harm avoidance. There's somebody else who tried to measure a distress tolerance, which might be thought of as a form of emotion dysregulation. Are we okay? Should we just pretend that everything's structurally sound? Yes. <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> um, so someone has found that uh, having higher, higher distress tolerance reduces risk for feeling suicidal, but increases risk if you happen to feel suicidal for progressing to attempts. So there are ways that, that emotion can have these different kinds of effects. There's also ways that emotion can move up and down a lot. One thing we're looking at now is whether certain kinds of dissociative experiences where you sort of feel unreal or maybe feel nothing can actually increase uh, likelihood of progressing to an attempt because it's almost a barrier to that kind of fear. Um, there's one study in adolescents showing that anhedonia was the one variable of everything that me they measured that distinguished attempters from ideators, perhaps because it kind of numbed the fear. I think there's a chance I'm not answering the question directly because th the last part I just I didn't fully get, but hopefully that's something on topic. Okay. How are you? I, I will say there, there is uh, there's speculation that the interventions that have been shown to reduce suicide risk, that one of the biggest drivers of those are improvement in emotion regulation that occurs during the course of that therapy. That is completely unproven. So that's speculation at this point, but there's not actually evidence to show that. Um, I will say I, I work with a suicide intervention researcher, and this is his, uh, his prominent theory as to the central mechanism of the treatment he developed for suicide risk. Mm -hmm. There is a meta-analysis of some DBT data suggesting that the improvement in coping skills, which is not quite the same as emotion regulation as you pointed out, but that the improvement in coping skills is what mediates the change in suicide attempt over time, which I think is encouraging but doesn't fully get at your point, I think. So in order to be identified as a mechanism of psych so you would need to see temporal precedence, so it would have to change first. Mm -hmm. It would then have to predict subsequent changes in the phenomenon that you're testing pretty high bar. Uh, very few trials are actually designed to do that, um, but it is absolutely an empirical question and studies can be designed to test that hypothesis. So I have another question about treatment actually, and this one is for you, Emma. Um, how did you finally find the therapist that made you feel like you hit the therapist lottery, as you said? Um. I, I mean, I, I think it was sort of just luck. I was working with an analyst, um, and the psychoanalysis obviously wasn't effective, at least not for, I mean, for me. Um, and it was honestly just through referral. I mean, I know that's kind of a, not a very exciting answer, but that's really just how it happened, and she mm -hmm. just happened to be, like, superwoman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Could you elaborate a little on the qualities that made this the right match for you? Um, what was it about this therapist as opposed to the others that really made it work? Um, okay, so, I mean, I've, I've met a number of DBT therapists, and I think, you know, I think sometimes people with borderline personality disorder, because we are really hypersensitive to social cues and, um, certain inter, um, you know, uh, interactions. I think sometimes because DBT is so structured and so strict, I think it's not uncommon that DBT therapists come off as being a little bit rigid. Um, and I mean, I know, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that that's just, you know, a, a misconception, but sometimes it can feel that way. and. I mean, the, this particular person just didn't have whatever that quality that I thought of as rigid, uh, yeah, rigidity. She just didn't have that. And so there was something about her warmth that just made me feel comfortable. Um, and really that, yeah, and it was just, I don't know, it was, it was luck. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 
Melanie Harnett, this one is also for you. Um, what modifications, if any, would you do if you were doing DBT-PE, your protocol, with an individual who struggled with BPD, PTSD, and psychosis? Um, so there, so none um, is kind of the answer. So there's actually really a, a big trial now of um, standard prolonged exposure therapy and EMDR, both um, for people with PTSD and psychotic disorders. Um, where uh, they got very good outcomes uh, on their PTSD outcomes, and they also found that um, doing PTSD treatment reduced uh, paranoia, specifically de paranoid delusions, um, had no impact on hallucinations one way or another, um, so they didn't change. Uh, so the sort of data seems to suggest um, that you can do this with people with psychotic disorders, um, and either the psychotic disorder will remain stable or may improve in some areas. Um, and in my most recent study, which, as I said, just barely finished, I don't have all the data, um, about a third of my sample has psychotic disorders. So, um, yeah. So more data on the way. That's exciting. Okay. So another question is, are there recommendations for treatment for people who are chronically at risk for suicide and self-injury with PTSD, but whose um, severity for suicide and self-injury is at this point too great to engage in the DBTPE protocol. What would one do in this scenario? <laughs> that's me, isn't it? All right. Um, so uh, there's sort of several thoughts. One is you know standard DBT. So that person is um, sounds like still a stage one um, kind of person. So keep you know keep at it with DBT and see if we can't get um, behaviors more controlled and risk down so that you could move into the um, stage two treatment. Uh, I'm not sure if part of that is that um, sort of there could be another option here to think about sort of a higher level of care possibly if it's somebody who's had a lot of um, stage one DBT and is still sort of struggling to get control. There's some potential of sort of trying to do the trauma-focused treatment in more of a residential setting or possibly inpatient setting um, uh, to if that sort of a, allows for sort of more safety monitoring and things like that for somebody who's um, still at higher risk and struggling to get that control. I had one very briefly. There's an active trial underway studying an exposure based treatment for PTSD mm -hmm. for folks while inpatient hospitalized for suicide risk. Um, but that's, to my knowledge, the first time that anyone has ever studied uh, in that proximity to imminent suicide risk. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we have more and more data on the way. This is fabulous. Okay. I have another question for the clinicians on the panel. How do you treat PTSD from early life events that a patient may not be able to fully recall or remember in entirety? Often an exposure-based protocol requires be, the ability to have a, a semi-clear memory of a traumatic event. What if a past trauma is clearly influencing a person's behavior, but they can't remember it well enough to process it? Are there recommendations or protocols people would suggest? And I'd toss that to any of the clinicians on the panel. I'm sure a few of you have ideas. I'll usually go with what they do remember, if they remember anything at all, and have them, you know, describe that in as much detail as possible. And then what we find is over time, as we work with them, more and more comes back to them. So uh, they're able to add more and more to that story. Um, if they really have completely no memory whatsoever, and I have seen this before, particularly, for example, in a case of, of, of date rape with, uh, with a drug, mm -hmm. where they didn't remember the rape at all, but were still very traumatized, you know, we're going to talk about what happened after, but also what they imagined happened or what they think happened, which is kind of driving a lot of the, the stress they're having. So, um, so that's, those are some of the techniques that I've used. Um, yeah, I agree with all of that. I would just add to that um, for people um, who are struggling to remember the details uh, or may not remember for because they were unconscious or who knows what, um, that to remember that we also always have the um, in vivo exposure going on potentially um, of doing exposure to things in the world. And so almost always they can clearly identify things they're avoiding in the world that um, are presumably related to the trauma even if they can't remember the details of the trauma to do a sort of elaborated narrative for imaginal exposure. One additional piece, um, this is 
Same, I agree 100% with what was said, especially about uh, date rape cases. And uh, within, within our veteran population, this is also true for people who are knocked unconscious. For example, like IED blasts, where people were knocked unconscious. There's often a lot of guilt and shame around not being able to remember those things. It's remarkable how much does come back over the course of treatment and the, the, the remarkable sense of kind of efficacy that comes out of people being saying, I'm so proud I'm able to remember this, these pieces of it over treatment. It's pretty amazing to watch as a clinician. Sounds like there is hope, even in these cases. I'm glad to hear it. All right, we are nearly at the end of our day today. I wanna offer us a couple of closing thoughts and some housekeeping items. Um, one of the things we've heard today is that treatment for people with borderline PD, with PTSD, who've experienced trauma, and for people who have emotion dysregulation, treatment can be effective and we have more treatment that needs to be studied and developed. We've heard a lot today about dialectical behavior therapy. There are many other treatments that have also been developed and studied for borderline personality disorder, um, some of which specifically do address trauma. So uh, there are many, many treatment options out there and we continue to need more research and more dedicated clinicians. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight from today that I kept hearing from our esteemed panelists here is that for those of us who are clinicians, it's on us to be really asking the questions about trauma, to be assessing this fully, and to be thinking broadly a little bit beyond Criterion A, especially when we're working with people from marginalized communities. I wanna thank our panelists here, all of our presenters for doing such amazing work and for bringing that to share with us today. Thank you so much for being here. I want to do a little matchmaking here. One of the questions that came up said, Boston points north. We've been searching for an adult evening DBT skills group for quite some time. We found DBT flavored groups, but we're really looking for full model DBT skills groups. If there are clinicians in the audience who work in Boston or points north, if you happen to be providing this or know of somebody who does and you'd be willing Come on down here and hang out by the exit sign for a few moments. The person who asked this question, please come as well. We'll see if we can make a match.